and welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime and today I'm really looking forward to spotlighting a very important mobster, Santo Traficante Sr. Traficante Sr. was crucial in the drug trade that's still used today and he secured his family's legacy through manipulation, multiculturalism, and murder. If you're enjoying the channel and would like to become a Racket Reviews patron, please head on over to the Patreon account and join the Coletti family. Now, without further ado, we have much to discuss, so let's get right to it. Santo Traficante, eventually known as Santo Traficante Sr., was born on May 24, 1886, to Alfonso and Lucia Traficante in Cianciana, Sicily. By the time Traficante was a teenager, Tampa was already home to many Sicilian immigrants, specifically from Cianciana, Alessandria de la Roca, and Santo Stefano. Likely driven to find success as a young man after hearing stories about his fellow immigrants from the old world, at 15 years old, Traficante boarded a steamship from Naples named Vincenzo Florio, which got him to the United States by way of Ellis Island in New York. He would then take a train to Tampa. It was in Tampa, at the turn of the century, that Traficante would meet the men with whom he would soon control the city, Ignacio and later Salvatore Italiano, who would go on to prove extremely valuable in the drug trade, and Ignacio Antonori, the man who would go on to be the nominal boss of the Tampa family ahead of Traficante. Both Italiano and Antonori were from Santo Stefano, Sicily, an area not far from Cianciana. Most of the men were making their money through the narcotics trade, but also through a gambling operation known as the Bolita Rackets. Bolita, meaning little ball in Spanish, was also known as the Cuban Lottery and made a fortune for a man brave enough to become a Bolita leader. Many of the Sicilian immigrants had muscled out the Cuban gangsters for control of this game by the 1920s, but no one controlled Bolita like Charlie Wall, the son of an influential political family who had opted for a life of crime instead. Wall's political connections and influence made him the Bolita King and made it impossible for any other mobster to realize his full potential in Tampa gambling. Traficante got to work quickly in the Bolita and narcotics rings. By 18 years old, Traficante was the leader of a youth gang and controlled several of the Bolita operations. The success of this crew would catch the eye of Mafia Kingpin Ignacio Antonotti by 1920, who, with his Italiano family associates and many others, had control of some of the largest casinos and Bolita operations in the city. Antonori needed to expand his operations further in order to compete with Wall. When he saw what the young Traficante was capable of, he took the budding mobster and his buddies under his wing. Another important immigrant Traficante would meet from Santo Stefano was Maria Giuseppa Cacciatore. Although I can't say for sure, I would wager that this meeting came by way of Cacciatore's brother. Joseph Giorgio Cacciatore was first in trouble with the law in 1925 for Bolita gambling charges and narcotics trafficking. He was four years Traficante's junior, not Traficante Jr., but Traficante's junior, and likely a member of his youth gang. But more important to Traficante, Cacciatore had a sister who caught his eye. Maria Giuseppe Cacciatore must have caught Traficante's eye immediately, as by April 20th, 1909, when Traficante was nearly 23 years old, the two were wed. Within almost a year exactly, the couple welcomed their first child, Frank Traficante, into the world on April 16, 1910. Throughout the next decade, Traficante was a very busy man, both in business and with his wife, it would seem. Maria Traficante would give birth to Luigi Santo Traficante Jr. on November 15, 1914. Then she would have Salvatore Traficante on November 14, 1916. Then Epifano Traficante on January 5, 1919 and then Enrico Traficante on November 23, 1924. In 1925, Santo Traficante Sr. would become a naturalized citizen of the United States. Traficante was also very involved in his community by way of fraternal organizations. He was a member of the Elks Lodge No. 708. He was a founding member of the Robin Hood Social Club, which did not specialize in stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, but rather put on plays and social activities. He was also involved with, and would eventually become a member of the board of directors for L'Unione Italiana, or Italian club, in Ybor City. This club was really the center of Tampa's Sicilian influence, much like the Unione Siciliana in Chicago. It is because of L'Unione Italiana that we have the construction of theaters, libraries, and many other buildings in Tampa, which replicate the splendor and design of the Greco-Roman structures that are more commonly seen in Europe. Meanwhile, in his work life, a big break came by way of the 18th Amendment, passed in 1919. By January 17, 1920, prohibition had begun. Around this time, Antonori had also taken note of Traficante's successful operations and absorbed him into what would become the Tampa Mafia family. With the passage of prohibition, many mobsters across the United States got to work setting up their illegal booze operations. Most of the northern cities relied on Canada as their source of liquor, either made locally or imported from Europe. 
The Midwest worked with what they had, notably corn, to create moonshine to be bought and shipped by gangsters willing to take the risk of selling it. In the Southwest, many found themselves partnered with Mexico for the importation of tequila and other spirits for their bootlegging operations. And in Florida, the state famous for being one of, if not the most unique state in the Union, had a special connection and nearly exclusive access to the island of Cuba. Through the many Cuban immigrants and easy access to the island, Tampa, Florida was already famous as Cigar City. The Cuban cigars were big business, especially in Tampa. In fact, according to Traficante himself, his legitimate work, and per his statements, his only work, was that of a cigar factory owner. Even if Traficante wasn't a mobster, he would have legitimate beef with Charlie Wall as he had helped fund the 900 Cuban families working in cigar businesses during the 1910 cigar workers' strikes. With the cigar industry already providing clean inroads into Cuba, as well as illicit narcotic routes, when prohibition was made into law, utilizing Cuba as a liquor supplier was an easy transition. Antinori utilized Traficante, the Italianos, and several other associates as key players in the gathering and distribution of rum, corn sugar, and molasses from Cuba, while other spots in the Caribbean were used for whiskey smugglings by way of Port Tampa Bay. Traficante and his right-hand man, Antonio Diachidue, are known to have made at least one trip to Havana in 1926. The money made from prohibition made these ambitious Floridian mobsters rich beyond their wildest dreams, and to make matters even better for them, Charlie Wall was not interested in competing. Wall provided alcohol at his clubs and casinos, but did not get directly involved in spirit smuggling. Traficante was among the top earners for the Tampa family, and this was due in no small part to his diversification. Sure, by the 1920s, Traficante was making money hand over fist with illegal booze, but let's not forget that he was also running huge narcotics rings and Bolita rackets. Bolita never stopped being popular in Tampa at this time. In fact, during Prohibition, its popularity increased. In Ybor City, Charlie Wall's Bolita Haven, Traficante set up his own Bolita club with his bar, the Rex Cafe. During Prohibition, you'll also find that a lot of these bars were referred to as cafes or soda shops in order to avoid suspicion. They didn't always avoid suspicion, but at least on paper, they were safe. The Florida State Attorney was certainly no fool and knew that the Rex Cafe was, quote, a Bolita place. Traficante knew essentially unparalleled success during the Prohibition era in Tampa, but all good things must come to an end. By the end of the decade, the Great Depression had taken hold across the country and the world. The flow of money was slower all around, and everyone from casino owners to farmers tightened their belts to make ends meet. The Great Depression did not, however, see an end to narcotics, booze, or bolita rackets. In fact, the former two might have seen an increase in conjunction with the desire to escape dire circumstances. Prohibition lasted until 1933, meaning there was a span of about five years where desperate people were unable to legally access a drink. Despite the augmented desperation of people with less and less to lose when accessing illegal substances, competition for people's hard-earned dollar heated up, and so did the violence in Tampa. From 1930 to 1959, we witnessed the city's era of blood, wherein 25 deaths connected with the criminal world would be recorded, and, as shown by the corruption of the Tampa law enforcement officers made evident during the Kefauver hearings, there was likely even more death and violence than we ever had on record. Traficante rose to the occasion, and by the start of the era of blood, was considered one of the top mobsters in Florida. Still under the leadership of Antonori, by most accounts, Traficante would become head of the Tampa family by October of 1940, when Ignacio Antonori was murdered. There is one theory that contends that Traficante Sr. was the mastermind behind Antonori's death. This belief relies on the fact that the murder weapon was from New Orleans, and the same type of weapon was used to murder another Antonori associate. The Traficantes have a long-term and known connection with the New Orleans crime family, specifically future boss Carlos Marcello. The theory maintains the Traficante, eager to get Antonori out of his way, worked with Marcello to take him out. While this is an interesting thought, and there are at least some reasonable connections to be drawn, I get the sense that it's a stretch. It's especially questionable when you consider that Antonori had problems with his Chicago outfit as he would not refund them their money for the bad shipment of narcotics that he gave them. Antonori's murder is unsolved, so it's free game for speculation. Most reports place Traficante Sr. into the role of boss following Antonori's death, but there's almost never a peaceful transition of power. It's believed by some that Salvatore Italiano, Antonori's underboss, stepped into the role of boss after Antonori was murdered. When Italiano retired in 1948, his underboss, James Lumia, became head of the Tampa family until his death in 1950, at which point Traficante took over. 
This transition is a lot messier and leaves a lot to be desired. Not that I'm afraid to let things get messy on this show, but there are also several timelines and details that don't quite add up. Let me share with you what gives me the most pause on this theory. There were Italiano loyalists that plagued Traficantes and his son's time as bosses. If Italiano had had his time at the helm, then retired and passed it to Lumia, who then died, it doesn't seem to make sense that Italiano's faction of the Tampa Mafia had such an issue with and caused so many problems for the Traficantes. It is my belief that there were several in the Tampa family who would have preferred Italiano's leadership and made their opinions known. We know from the historic record that the Tampa House Divided led to several shootouts and murders resulting in infighting and not from battles with mobsters under Charlie Wall. You don't have to just take my word for it. If you do have a disagreement or if you have information that I'm missing about Italiano, please share that with me in the comment section below. I would love to learn more about that. In any case, in 1940, Traficante, as far as I can tell, becomes the boss of the Tampa family, thus sealing the organization into our minds as the Traficante family. This was also the year that Charlie Wall was forced out of Tampa, and thus his role as the city's most powerful mobster went to Traficante as well. According to Mafia lore, Wall was promised protection against further attempts on his life by Traficante Sr. in exchange for Wall's exit from Tampa. It seemed this deal with Traficante Sr. expired upon the mobster's death and did not carry over with Traficante's son, much like Emilio Barzini in The Godfather. Speaking of Traficante Jr., it is widely reported that he was in New York City training under Thomas Lucchese during the 1940s. We know that Traficante Sr. was well-connected and worked with leaders from several states, but his close working relationship with Tommy Lucchese is the most notable in terms of drug trade and bootlegging. It has also been reported that in addition to receiving training from Lucchese, Traficante Jr. got lessons from Lucky Luciano as well. That seems unlikely, since Luciano was imprisoned from 1935 to 1945, then deported in 1946. But I suppose if Traficante went to New York really early, that it's possible, but I'm skeptical of the Luciano claim. Through the 1940s, Traficante Sr. was busy establishing drug channels and is specifically noted to have created a trade pathway from Buenos Aires to Cuba to Florida through Miami and of course, everywhere in between. In Cuba, he even worked with a former enemy and Charlie Wall narcotics leader, George Saturday Zarate. Zarate had close ties with Lucky Luciano, a connection shared with Traficante. Zarate had moved to Cuba after the Traficante faction during the era of blood had made an attempt on his life, but that was water under the bridge now. It is from the drug trade coming in from Cuba to Miami, where Charlie Wall lived in exile, that we see the growth of the Tampa family's arm into the southernmost portions of the state. And we see expansion moved northward into Orlando and Jacksonville, then west heading toward Alabama and the Gulf, stretching into New Orleans, where the family worked closely with Marcello. Then continue this drug distribution throughout the United States, and you have a true visual of this family's power. It's reported that by September of 1945, Traficante Sr. and his son, Santo Jr., now back from his training in New York, met with George White, a Bureau of Narcotics head who seemed to be making deals with the Traficantes to permit their international drug operations in South America. In other words, the Traficantes had federal leadership in their pockets. All of this was very exciting, and Traficante had expanded the family's influence far beyond the borders of the state. But what's even more fascinating to think about is the fact that he was able to do this with all of this infighting from the Italiano crowd. Imagine how much more could have been accomplished if all factions of the Tampa Mafia had focused on Traficante's vision. By the end of the 1940s, Traficante Sr. was passing more and more responsibility to his son. This passage of power led to even more infighting and deaths within the Tampa family. It did the opposing factions little good though. The Traficante's power was airtight thanks to all of the groundwork laid by Traficante Sr. The end of Traficante Sr.'s impressive era was in December of 1950, when the Kefauver Senate Committee came to Tampa to question Mafia leaders and affiliates in an attempt to expose the city's corruption. Far from only stopping in Tampa, the Kefauver hearings continued across the country and Tampa was no exception. Traficante and his son, however, decided to skip town during those hearings. It is around this time that Charlie Wall spilled the beans about nearly all of the Tampa Mafia's inner workings and organized crime structures. He should have been killed right away, but Traficante Sr. had guaranteed his protection. Traficante Sr. had been diagnosed with stomach cancer, which is likely the reasoning for the haste around the peaceful transition of power to his son. Traficante Sr. knew he was living on borrowed time. The last few years of his life were spent training his son, getting his affairs in order, and saying goodbye to his loved ones. 
He died on August 11, 1954, in Tampa. His body was placed in a bronze casket with glass lining at Wilson Salmon Funeral Home until he was driven through Ybor City by the police, now officially owned by his son. The procession, filled with flowers, stretched from the funeral home to his gravesite, while according to reporters, underworld faces were sprinkled throughout the crowd. Santa Traficante Sr. was buried at L'Unione Italiana Cemetery in Ybor City, Florida. His wife Maria would live another 17 years before her passing and burial beside him in 1971, the same year that their eldest son Frank also passed away. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews, spotlighting one of the most important mafia bosses and one of the most important mafia families, both of which often get overlooked. Traficante Sr. had a battle on two fronts. Number one, he was the boss of the Tampa family, often dismissed. And number two, he wasn't even the Tampa member with the most name recognition. His son, Traficante Jr., would go on to reach even further heights than his father, but none of that would have been possible without Traficante Sr.'s hard work and dedication. Make sure to let me know in the comments section below or on Facebook and Twitter what you think about Traficante Sr. Also, don't forget to check out the Patreon account. If you would like to become a patron member of the Coletti family, you can do that by following that link. Today, I do want to give a very special shout out to Paul Smith, the first of my subscribers to donate to the level of Consigliere. So Consigliere Paul, thank you very much for your generosity and thanks to the generosity of all of my Patreon subscribers. In the meantime, don't forget to let me know in the comments section or social media who or what you would like to see covered next. I always love hearing from you and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao.